there are four reasons why your big three isn't even a thing. Now, if you practice traditional astrology, or if you've been practicing modern astrology and made the switch to traditional astrology, you may have gotten sucked up within the vortex of talking about your big three. Because let's face it, everyone today wants to talk about that big three. You go to conferences, people want to talk about the big three. You go to Thanksgiving dinner, people want to talk about your big three. Everybody wants to talk about your big three. But if you're really serious about practicing traditional astrology, here are four things that you need to know about why that just doesn't jive well within the context of our practice. And make sure that you stick around until the end of the video where I'll be sharing with you what to do if you're trying to wean yourself off of your sun, moon, and rising, and what you can actually replace that with within the context of your natal astrology readings. Thing number one is that this concept of the big three really came up with astrologers such as Alan Leo, who was more concerned with delineating the shape of a person's character than he was concerned with really talking about the concrete events that occur within that person's life. So if you're talking about the big three, you're literally practicing psychological astrology in one of its earliest forms. And truthfully speaking, if you're a traditional astrologer and you're talking to people about their big three, you would might as well have been talking to them about the amount of elements they have represented within their birth chart, which is also something that we definitely don't do in traditional astrology. Within this concept of the big three, we really hear people talking about the sun, the moon, and the rising. And that really represents the supremacy that the sun took within the context of modern astrology which, once again, isn't really something that we find in traditional astrology at all. Now, it's not saying that the sun and the moon aren't really important chart factors, but truthfully, the sun and the moon from a traditional astrological perspective serve very specific purposes, and one of their core purposes is to determine whether or not we have a daytime chart or a nighttime chart. And while in traditional astrology, we do have this notion of determining which of those two planets, the sun or the moon, is actually the inside ruler for the chart, meaning if we're born in the daytime, then the sun is the governing luminary, and if we're born in the nighttime, then the moon is the governing luminary. And that helps us determine really cool stuff, especially from a medical astrology perspective, such as the level of vitality that a person has throughout the various parts of their lives. And that's a very cool technique that I'd love to share with you in another video. But as for now, what you need to know is that that really was where the buck stopped in so far as using the sun and the moon within a nativity. Outside of that, the major importance of the sun and the moon was pretty much the same level of importance that the other planets had in so far as all they did was represented the affairs of the houses that they ruled. Therefore, from a traditional astrological perspective, the importance of the sun really has more to do with the house that the sun rules and how the sun carries the affairs of the house that it rules wherever it goes within the chart, as opposed to the sun being the be-all and the end-all of astrology in general, which just isn't true within the context of traditional astrology. Now, what we do find happening again and again within traditional astrology is this use of the moon, as representing the vegetative part of the human soul, whereas Mercury represents the humane or the intellectual part of the human soul. But even within that, we're still not talking about the sun, the moon, and Mercury. We're really just talking about the moon and Mercury essentially representing how we manifest in a psychological way within the world around us, as well as how we manifest ourselves intellectually within the world around us, which was very important for traditional astrologers in judging the wit as well as the manner of a person. And this analysis of the moon, Mercury, and really the ascendant really constituted our understanding of traditional approaches to psychological astrology. But in terms of analyzing the sign of the zodiac, of the sun, moon, and rising of a person, that's just something that we don't find anywhere within traditional astrology. And if you're a traditional astrologer still practicing in that way, you should probably stop. <laughs> and the reason you should stop is because there are far more nuanced and far more exciting things that you can do within an actual reading than to spend a great deal of time interpreting the sun, moon, and rising as if it were actually a thing. Reason number two why your sun, moon, and rising aren't actually a thing is because traditional astrology is more planet-based than it is signs of the zodiac based. What we see happening to astrology as it moves down through the 19th century into the 20th century was this elaborate interpretation of what it meant to have my sun, my moon, or my ascendant degree in such and such a sign. And we really find an elaboration on the interpretation of the sign of the zodiac that these things are in happening far more in the 20th century than it had ever 
ever happened in 4,000 years of previous astrological history. So today within our astrology, we tend to find people focusing far more on the interpretation of the sign of the zodiac that things are in, which is absolutely a surefire way, not just to practice vague astrology that doesn't actually carry concrete details about the concrete realities of a person's life, but it actually doesn't allow you to nuance and fine tune your understanding of the soul and psyche of that person in a way that actually reflects the complexes of things that occur within that person psychologically. And we find a far more skillful approach to psychological astrology occurring within traditional astrology than we find within even psychological astrology. One of the things that modern astrologers say about traditional astrologers is that traditional astrologers don't really know how to talk about the personality or the character of a person from reading their birth chart, which is patently untrue. And the reason why it's untrue is because traditional astrology has always been a pragmatic system. And within a pragmatic system, the very first thing we need to know is who has this chart. And insofar as knowing who has this chart is concerned, we do focus a great deal on figuring out what represents the psychological constitution of the person for whom we're going to be giving the reading. The difference is how we approach and how we prioritize that psychological understanding of a person from within the context of traditional astrology is very different from the major way in which the psychology of a person is prioritized within the 21st century. I've done my fair bit of perusal online and I've seen quite a few astrologers who call themselves traditional astrologers still giving people sun, moon, and rising readings. And what is that? What do you actually do when you give someone a sun, moon, and rising reading that's that profound that it really needs to take up the entire hour-long session? So I think the actual difference between actually practicing traditional astrology in an authentic way versus practicing modern astrology with the veneer of a classical approach on top of it is that traditional astrology First, it deals with assessing the soul, the psyche, the wit, and the manner of the person. And after that's done, we have the rest of our time together to talk about all the actual concrete considerations that occur within your life that cause you to be that way in the first place. And this ability to draw real, tangible, concrete events from a birth chart is something that is absolutely lacking within modern astrology. Because it's one thing to tell someone how they felt about what happened, and it's another thing entirely to be able to look at the birth chart and tell that person, what were the concrete events that occurred within their lives that led to those feelings in the first place. And when you're actually practicing traditional astrology the way that it should be practiced, then the ability to talk about concrete events that occur within the person's life is something that you'll be able to do in your sleep. Now, I went on a bit of a tangent there because what I really meant to say was that traditional astrology is far more planet-based. If we even were to prioritize the sun, the moon, and the rising in any major way, our main questions would be, what are the planets that are in aspect to the sun, the moon, and the rising? Not just the sun, the moon, and the rising on their own terms. This second point about traditional astrology being more planet-based than actually being signs of the zodiac base is a really important one because one of the drawbacks that's happened within modern astrology is that everyone can tell you what it means to have your Venus in Gemini. But we don't really find people being able to tell us what it means to have your Venus in Gemini occupying the antition of Saturn, squaring Jupiter, and in opposition to Mars. Because that ability to speak about planets and to speak about combinations of stellar influences within our birth chart from this planet-to-planet -planet perspective is something that hasn't been as readily fostered in modern astrology as we find it being fostered in traditional astrology. Reason number three as to why your sun, moon, and rising aren't actually a thing is because if you're really trying to develop a traditional astrological practice within your life, then your judgment on the personality and the character of a person really stops at the ascendant. Within traditional astrology, when we're speaking about the personality and the character of a person, we're really only talking about the ascendant as a primary factor. We want to know what planets are occupying the ascendant, because in the words of 17th century astrologer Jean-Baptiste Moran, determination by location is immediate. And that means that if a planet is in your ascendant and the ascendant 
ascendant itself is representing your soul, your psyche, and your persona, then the planets within your ascendant are having a direct impact on how your soul, psyche, and persona are manifesting within the material world. But those planets, because more than likely, if we're speaking about the seven classical planets of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon, those planets also are the rulers of other houses within your birth chart, which means that the presence of those planets within your ascendant not only represents those planets as being planetary colors to the personality that you bring to the world, but they also represent the concrete physical realities in your life and the concrete physical events that you've experienced within your environment that specifically and that directly cause you to be exactly who you are. So when practicing traditional astrology, we always have to remember two things. A planet represents what it represents universally based on what that planet is. For example, Venus represents love and Jupiter represents wealth. So the planets will always represent what they represent universally, and they'll always carry the imprints of their universal significations wherever we find them within our birth charts. However, within traditional astrology, those planets also rule houses. And when we see planets that rule houses within our ascendant, it represents that those things that those planets rule are having a direct impact on our early childhood environment, as well as on the personality that evolved out of that early childhood experience. After we take a look at the planets in the Ascendant, we also want to know what planets are aspects in the Ascendant. After we take a look at aspects to the Ascendant, we also want to know what planet is ruling the Ascendant. After we take a look at what planet is ruling the Ascendant and where that planet is, we also want to know what planets are aspecting the planet that rules the Ascendant. And after we have completed all of those things which are highly Ascendant focused, we move on for the purpose of doing the other things within a chart. How long can you talk to a person about their personality within their birth chart? Are you going to spend an entire hour doing it? You focus on the ascendant, you talk about the soul and the psyche, you talk about the personality, you don't talk about the sun, the moon, and the rising, and you get it over with, and then you go on and talk about the actual concrete things that are occurring within that person's life. You talk to them about their money, you talk to them about their family, you talk to them about their love life, you talk to them about their career, and those things really represent the pillars of a strong traditional astrology reading, all of which should be able to fit within your hour-long session because you're not going to take that entire hour just to talk to a person about their personality, which tends to be a very non-dimensional thing to do. Because if you talk to me for an entire hour about my personality, I still want to know, am I going to be rich? What's my relationship with my family going to be like? Am I going to have kids? Am I going to get married? Am I going to have career success? Those things are actually just as important to me being a well-adjusted human being within the world as is me having an everlasting assessment of my personality flaws and perfections. <laughs> Reason number four as to why your sun, moon, and rising really aren't even a thing is because if you go online and do a quick web search of astrology being a hoax or of astrologers getting it wrong in public, we oftentimes find that the astrologers who elect themselves to represent us as an astrological community are astrologers who only have the ability to talk about the sun, the moon, and the rising. And beyond that very egregious limitation that they have to only talk about the sun, moon, and rising, when pushed and put to the task, they really only have the ability to talk about the signs of the zodiac that the various planets in our charts are in. And that is something that will always put us as an astrological community to shame. And the reason for that is because talking to someone about the sign position that their Mars is in on public television, as if the sign of their Mars is the be-all and the end-all of their lives, when hundreds of thousands of other babies was born during the same time when that Mars was in that same sign, is ridiculous. If we're going to actually represent astrology in public, we have to practice a far more nuanced astrology. And I'm sad to be the one to inform you that if the only astrology you practice is an astrology that consistently references the signs of the zodiac as a part of the reason why within a person's life, then your astrology is severely lacking. And I think it's well worth us all as an astrological community doing a survey on ourselves taking a recording of ourselves and seeing how frequently we mention the actual signs of the zodiac that people's natal planets are in. And if you do that, you'll probably be shocked to find out that that really constitutes the brunt of your reading. Our astrology is an extraordinary tool to describe the events of our lives in extraordinary ways. 
and what's happened to it in the last hundred years in terms of it being so signs of the zodiac focused is preposterous. If you want to be an extraordinary astrologer, and if you actually want to practice a type of astrology that has the ability to prove astrology, which I can guarantee you is very much the direction that astrology is going into. Astrology is one of the most booming industries within the spiritual marketplace at this moment. Never before has astrology been called to the stand as it's being called to the stand right now to stand up for itself and prove that it deserves a place at the table. Right now, the world is demanding all of us to get far more serious about the type of astrology that we practice. And an astrology that's only based in the signs of the zodiac is vastly deficient. And when I teach intensives and when I teach workshops and I ask people to describe in planetary terms the specific concrete events that clients say they've been through within their lives, their automatic default nine out of 10 times is on the sign of the zodiac that this person's Venus is in. Therefore, dot, dot, dot. Or the sign of the zodiac that this person's sun is in. Therefore, dot, dot, dot. Oh, actually, look at the sign of the zodiac that this person's Saturn is in. Therefore, dot, dot, dot. And in the process of us doing that as an astrological community, we are actively denying ourselves of the actual tangible fruits of concrete magic that astrology represents in this world today. Astrology is one of the most powerful systems that we have at our disposal, not just to describe the cosmic structure pattern of our personality, but also to define this concrete moment in history in which we find ourselves. So I hope at the end of all of this, this has given you some food for thought in terms of giving yourself other things to do when you look at the birth chart in order to describe and define the personality of a person, other than to default to the modern astrology holy trinity of the sun, the moon, and the rising sign. And honestly, if you feel as if that's really something that you can't let go of because you're really attached to it, then challenge yourself a little bit and push yourself over that growth edge and see, are there other places within this chart that I can find this information from that I was only finding through the sun, moon, and rising? Could I still give a comprehensive chart reading if I minimized my use of these three factors within my actual reading? Because very often what happens is we fill up a reading with the sun, the moon, and the rising, the position of a person's nodes, the position of a person's Pluto, how much of which element is represented within the person's chart, how much of which modality is represented in the person's chart. And we fill our astrology up with all of these ornamental things. And before we know it, an hour passes by and we haven't actually committed a concrete act of astrology. And insofar as we're all being called to represent astrology in the more concrete way in this 21st century, we all need to enter every chart reading with far more concrete tools. If you've enjoyed this video and you're now hungry to find out ways in which you can replace your previous approach to always centralizing the sun, moon, and rising, then make sure to check out this video in which I describe to you how to begin a traditional astrological reading like a traditional astrology boss. And make sure to sign up for my upcoming free live webinar on how to read a birth chart like a pro by signing up with the link in the description box. If you're ready to master traditional astrology and take your astrology to the next level in which you're giving concrete event-based readings that you and your clients can rely on, then sign up for our astrologer certification program that begins this October 2022.